Would it kill you to say something? No. That's the first thing you've said in the last four hours. That's that's a fountain of conversation, man. That's a geyser. I mean, whoa, daddy. Stand back, man. Shit. I'm sitting here driving, doing all the driving, man. The whole fucking way. Just trying to chat, you know? Keep up our spirits. Fight the boredom of the road. And you can't say one fucking thing in the way of conversation? Oh, fuck it. I don't... I don't have to talk to you either, man. See how you like it. Just total fucking silence. Two can play it, that smart guy. We'll just see how long you like it. Total silence. I, I don't I don't know about that, Steve Bashimi. Um Is it Fargo, don't you know? Yeah, and then they stopped at the pancake house and you know. <laughs> Yeah, and they were driving into Minneapolis. To boot. Joe's Movie Club Cast. It's Justin. And I'm Joey. And at long last, we've reached the end of our series of for movies that Joey loves. And we're wrapping it up in spectacular fashion with a couple bangers, including Joey's fave, Old Boy, Old Brother, Where Out Thou from the Coens, and another selection Joey is going to be fine, pretty fetch. Is that, are, are you given a hint to what you're picking? Oh, not at all. Not at all. You would never... I don't you know? <laughs> don't you know? I have to say that um, I don't just know that quote off the top of my head. I just happened to um, Carl watches these videos on YouTube where there's this girl who reacts to movie like she watches movies for the first time, mm -hmm. and literally one of the ones we watched yesterday was Fargo, mm. and that scene. So it was like I was like, oh well, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Well, um, yeah, there's uh, there's spoilers in our uh, full lengthy conversations and analysis of these movies. And um, we'd love to hear from you. So make sure to comment, subscribe, be part of the Movie Club cast. So f what's up with you, man? Ooh. Watched a few movies, nothing crazy, working, looking for a job. Um, one of my buddies came into town. We got some dinner the other night, hung out and chatted. That was pretty fun. Um, brewing up magic decks, playing magic on arena. That is really it. I, I don't do anything really that exciting. So, um, you still do like a magic night every week. <clears throat> um, not every week. We try to every week. Um, we didn't last week. Um, so we're going to try to this week, I think, but there's some people you know, doing some stuff. And so we may not have one. We might, it just depends. But, um, they've got a computer game called magic, the gathering arena, hmm. um, or just like magic arena and you can play on there. Um, so I've been playing on there a good bit. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't get the social itch of the game out. Um, cause it's like hmm. a one-on-one -on -one and you know, can't talk to the people you're playing it's kind of like they're just a faceless opponent kind of thing but mm -hmm. it's fun because you, you know get to play with different cards and different strategies and that kind of stuff but neato so i've been on a classic literature kick so like the other day i was like hey uh, 
like football season's in, you know, over, so like it's a bunch of like speculation on like drafts and stuff, so that gets kind of dull, pretty repetitive. So um, yeah, I was I never um, like Catcher in the Rye is a book I've always like been interested in because it's like not a movie and like I don't even think there's an audio book of it. And so, like, I randomly was like, hey, what's Catcher in the Rye about? So I YouTube that, and I found, I found this thing called uh, Thug Notes, where it's like this, this guy is, like, you know, he's talking like a gangster or whatever, but he's, like, explaining the plots of all these, like, great literary works. And he has, like, over 120 videos or something, and I, like, watched all of them. <laughs> so um, going beyond that, uh, yeah, so... Uh, Actually, I have a copy of Catcher in the Rye, so starting to, to work through that. And I also picked up um, a, Dosk a Dostoevsky book, um, The Brothers Karamazov, and then a Thomas Pynchon book, which Thomas Pynchon wrote, uh, Inherent Vice. His, uh, he has a book called uh, Gravity's Rainbow. Um, so these are supposed to be really hard literature. And the, they're works that, like... You're supposed to like read the first hundred pages and really kind of be baffled by it, but then kind of get in the groove after that. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of like teaching myself more like patience by like actually doing some like um, paperback book kind of, uh, you know, consumption. So um, it's, it's a, I find it a little kind of relaxing in ways. Okay. Okay. I can, I can get, I can dig it. Can you recall the last paperback <laughs> you picked up? The last paperback that I picked up was either RPO, which is before the movie came out, and the I thought the book was much better than the movie, which the movie was fine. It wasn't anything bad, but it wasn't anything great. Um, but I okay. think actually I picked up, I think I picked it up after that. Is it's called, um, oh, my superpower is crazy, hmm. which is um a book about former professional wrestler AJ Lee. Um, so it's her, her autobiography. So you okay. write your own one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's her book. Um, I think that was the last paper book that I picked up. <clears throat> nice. Uh, totally blinked on what I was going to ask next, but, um, I guess that's a good thing. So we can talk about movies now, right? Let's fucking so, go. The good, the bad and the ugly. All right, so I'm going traditional today with good, bad, and ugly. I'm going very, uh, very far away from that. I have lead farmer. I'm not spectacular anymore, and Mr. Torg. Oh, those are very eclectic. Let me go first. Okay. Oh, you want me to pick from you, or you're going to go first and pick from me? You're going to pick uh, what what I'm going to do. All right, give me the good. All right, the good is. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. So, like, I kind of had a hot take in my uh, review of this, saying this, like, might be the superior, like, 80s time travel movie, even though it's barely 80s. It's, like, 89. But, you know, I need a movie to unwind, and I saw Bill and Ted on there, and I was like, that looks pretty fun. Even though I really didn't like the last Bill and Ted movie, because I, like, thought, like, I don't know, dudes, like, old dudes acting like young dudes, like rubs me the wrong way like Step Brothers, like that movie drives me bonkers like men acting like men uh man babies or whatever so um yeah but bill and ted definitely hit a nice sweet spot um, i love how they're like jumping in and out of time like the whole the whole uh deal in order to like collect all these like famous dudes in order to do their their final report and the the final report's a whole lot of fun because they like they're doing like this whole like rock concert thing and it's just a blast all the way through. It's a very feel-good movie and just charmed the hell out of me. Bill and Ted, it's worth revisiting. And I think it's on Max. So. Okay, nice, nice. <clears throat> you seen it? Not since I was a child. I have not seen it in a long time. I saw Wayne's World like the month before, and I definitely like Bill and Ted better than the first Wayne's World. So, for what that's worth. Wayne's World, party on spectacular okay i'm not spectacular anymore oh, i'm not i'm not spectacular anymore i'm not spectacularly beautiful i'm not spectacular spectacularly talented and mm -hmm. then at this point mm -hmm. in the movie the narrator kicks in which is helen mirren and says note to the um to the casting member don't cast margot robbie 
to say these lines uh, it's, uh Barbie. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah. So I finally got around to watching to to watching Barbie. Um, great cast. Uh, it's a very good movie. Definitely. Um, I know a lot of people were like, oh, this isn't for my kids. And I was like, well, yeah, no, this is definitely made for people our age who grew up with Barbies their whole life. Not that children now don't, but I think it was definitely more prevalent then. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is a great movie. Um, you know, Oscar season, Oscar season floating around. Definitely should check it out. Um, mm -hmm. Nominated I mean, just be ready. It's, it's a lot of pink. And uh, Ryan Gosling somehow for Best Supporting Actor – even though he's the lead actor, I'm not really sure how that works, but he was kind of supporting. I can kind of see where he was the at. lead actor in that movie, though. Who, who else? Will Ferrell? I don't think so. No, 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 definitely. That's Will Ferrell was great character. in that movie too, by the way. Yeah, he um, was. He, he worked in there for sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. So that's uh, the I'm not spectacular anymore. Okay. All right. Give me your bad. My bad is for the bad special effects in Star Trek, the motion picture. Although it's not nearly as dull as what uh, the internet would lead you to believe nowadays. I listened to a uh, Patton Oswalt uh, did like his best like five Star Trek movies and his worst. No, no, no. Best sci-fi movies and worst sci-fi movies. And he put Star Trek, the motion picture in his bottom five and then Rat the Con in his top five. But, um... I like how like they do the sciencey stuff in this one. Um, the costumes are terrible. They're like gray and beige and very seventies shag pad ish. So uh, that's not cool. Um, it was interesting to see the threat be so menacing throughout. Even though like I know what happens at the end. Have you seen the original Star War Star Trek? The original Star Wars, obviously Star Trek maybe i definitely didn't i was really more into like next gen and i've mm -hmm. seen a couple of the newer movies okay but i i don't actually i don't think i've seen the original trek um i no. could have i've seen two of the three newer ones with um pine chris, chris pine and uh, uh benadryl cucumber and um <laughs> he was in the second one <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> cucumber <laughs> <laughs> but it's real cucumber. <laughs> but yeah, like compared to like 2001 and Star Wars, like a lot of the special effects of like space are really, really lame in this movie. And like this movie, like like a whole 30 minutes of the runtime is like, ooh, look at the pretty stuff in space. And it's like, eh, we kind of already did that by this point. So it was definitely not as glamorous in that effect. But like this whole idea, like like the the warp drive's not ready whenever they take off at first. So they but um. You know, um, Kirk wants to go to warp anyways, and so that causes them to go into a wormhole and almost run into an asteroid, so that's all pretty thrilling. And then they run into this uh, space cloud of doom called Viger. Uh, Viger. Um, but I won't spoil it. There's a there's kind of a space asshole at one point that they go into, so that's uh, that was saucy. But um, not great effects, but um, not a bad Trek movie either, because I think at the end of the day, Trek is about the characters, and the characters deliver in this one. Alrighty. Lead farmer. I'm a lead farmer, motherfucker. Uh, I finally got around to in the year of 2024 of our Lord uh -huh. uh, to seeing the action or the comedy spectacular that is Tropic Thunder. That's funny. Um, I had never seen it before. I uh -huh. always like when it came out in 2008. Um, you know, I was a much, much younger person and it definitely, it just looked like the wrong kind of stupid. It was the completely correct kind of stupid. Um, very satirical, which I don't know at in 2008, 2009, whatever I would have picked up on. Mm. Um, would not, would have just, I would have just been like, yo, why is RDJ in blackface? Like, <laughs> um, you know, like what the hell? Um, yeah, no freaking freaking hilarious um mm -hmm. danny mcbride is freaking great like just every everybody is a star-studded cast too like it's you should jack just black's in there right yeah jack black he um, kind of he kind of plays a douche in that movie doesn't he they all play douches they're all like <laughs> prepadama actors he's uh, like a drug addict um and then there's the black guy whose name is at his he his his name is Al Pacino. Al Pacino 
it yeah. fucking it's it's great. Um, yeah, it's good shit. I I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I wish I had seen it sooner, but okay. alrighty. So my and misdirection, um, or my ugly, <laughs> yeah, ugly here, misdirection look. is. Mean Girls. So, um, yeah, I just uh, put that there because of yeah the ugly attitudes of the uh, the plastics, right? I so, mean, the, the plastics are cold hard. I mean, cold hard plastic. What do you think of like the uh, African uh, like animal scenes in this movie? They're they're pretty bonkers, huh? The the the. the... There's like whenever over, she's like, like describing what yeah, high school yeah, is yeah. like, and like, she compares it. She was sitting on an elephant. No, you mean like in animal world versus girl world? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of. I mean, it's interesting. It's cool, but yeah, it is a little bonkers. So, like, you like this movie because of the actresses, right? I mean, that's like your main draw here. I mean, at some point, yes. I mean, obviously, when this movie came out, I would I would have been all about the actresses. I actually think. It is pretty funny. Um, and it's pretty well written by Tina Fey. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, um, sharp. And it, it definitely, um, it, it, you know, we've all been in high school with those people where being cool is more important and you don't know if those people are really your friends or not Th that whole thing. And it's happened even, even in adult life when you leave high school, like people still act like that. So I, I think it's something everybody can relate to. You can relate to having your first crush and, not knowing how to talk to them or, you know, thinking because so-and-so might like them, it might hurt my social status or this or whatever. So we, we've mm -hmm. all, it's just all very relatable. And then this is, um, I'm not going to go into super great detail with this, but Mean Girls is my closer movie. Um, so that's when I need to close the deal. I put this movie <laughs> on. Um, okay. knowing, knowing it word for word also kind of helps for some reason that is a, like a very impressive thing. So, um, mm -hmm. that is completely coincidental. I don't actually know how that happened. It just kind of started happening. So, um, that's a thing, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, um, I think, I think it's a really good movie, especially considering how old it is now that it still pretty well holds up. Um, but yes, like, um, Amanda Seyfried is nice to look at. Um, mm -hmm, Rachel McAdams mm -hmm. was like in her prime, nice to look at. Um, this is Lilo mm -hmm. before she went off the drugs. Mm -hmm, okay. And they even made Lizzie Kaplan not look good, um, or tried to anyway, so, which is Janice. But I mean, if you've seen like anything else that Lizzie Kaplan has been in, you're like, bro, we, we know Lizzie Kaplan is a nice looking person, so. This is only the second time I'd seen it. I saw it in college with uh, Christina, and then uh, this was the first time in a long, long time. Um, oh yeah, very pink. Uh, yeah, it, yes. you know, it kind of has that girly feel to it, which was interesting watching it, you know, solo. But uh, very entertaining. Um, I mean, all the actresses are gorgeous. Um, really cutthroat, interesting. Um, it's yeah, with uh, how Lindsay starts is like, you know, like the outsider who's just trying to like get in, but then she ends up kind of turning plasticky and in the process, but then comes back to the, the good side. <laughs> then Regina gets hit by a, a bus. Yeah. She gets hit by a bus. <laughs> wow. So, um, I, and lives somehow. She, she's a superhero apparently. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, she's in the Marvel universe now, so you know that's fine, I guess. Um, uh, the um, yeah, the scenes where like she's describing high school, like a, an African watering hole, is very odd. But um, I guess it, I guess it flows together since you know, like her parents were in Africa or whatever. Um, enjoyed it quite a bit. It'll be interesting to dive into with my my review, just since we're not like picking picking every little piece of meat off the bone here, but um. Yeah, just kind of getting the gist oh, like out the of war, like what you loved it. The, the warthog carcass? Yeah, I got you. <laughs> All right, you're Mr. Tr Trog? Mr. Torg. Torg. Which, Torg. If you have not played Borderlands, you won't get the Mr. Torg reference, but Mr. Torg was a character in Borderlands. He was an NPC, um, and he liked explosions so much that there's a few missions you run around, and he just screams explosions the whole time. So this is the... The second half of the Barbenheimer Spectacular, Oppenheimer. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah. 
fantastic Christopher Nolan movie. I mean, it is definitely a Chris Nolan movie. You got to. The only thing it was missing was like, um, what's his name? Why the fuck did I just blank? Michael Caine. That was like the only thing that was missing was Michael uh-huh. Caine. But um, fantastic movie, great cast. Killian Murphy is great. Florence Pugh is great. Blunt's great. RDJ is great. I think he personally set out to prove that he could still act. Um, Matt Damon is um, great. So, yeah, he's great. a son of a bitch too in this movie. Oh yeah, he's he's a fucking bastard with a capital bastard. Um, <laughs> but I mean, he's great. He, he's great in it. He deserves his Oscar nod. This movie deserves like what is it, thirteen nominations or something? Probably. It's um, my favorite for yeah. um, so far. I mean, I've only seen the two, and it's my favorite of those two. But um, yeah, no, it's it's very good. It is long. But it is it doesn't it didn't feel long like mm-hmm. there was there was a spot where like I had to stop to pee and it was getting close to the bomb going off and I was like or you know testing the bomb or whatever and I was like how how the fuck else is there like another hour of this movie but then they did it and it 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 didn't feel like they just tacked it on so mm-hmm. um and this one is on Peacock so it's pretty easy to watch um yeah. If, you, if you've got Peacock. And then if not, I'm sure it's rentable on Amazon or something. So, Yeah, I'm trucking through all the best picture noms. I just got my buddy uh, Marvin to recommend me uh, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, so I have a little bit more motivation to buckle down on that. And then, um, so right after the podcast, I'll be hanging out with my dad and watching Wrath of Khan. But um, when I do get some more time to myself... Zone of Interest, um, that's the same director as um, uh, Under the Skin, so really looking forward to that. Um, oh, American... the Under the Skin is weird as shit, though. Mm-hmm. Which, I this... say that, I haven't I haven't watched it since, like, Letterboxd and, you know, doing the podcast and shit. Like, it was, what, 2013, 2014, something like that when I watched it. Like, mm-hmm. it was weird as shit. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's, yeah. Yep, so, Zone of Interest, American Fiction, Killers of the Flower Moon, Past Lives, and Poor Things is what I have left to watch. Hopefully, Poor Things will start streaming before the Oscars, because it's not su- sure if... It's supposed mm-hmm. to. I think I saw somewhere that it was, that it was coming to streaming pretty soon. I could be wrong about that, uh, but I thought I saw that somewhere. Hmm. Um... I'm hopefully going to be watching Flowers of the Killer Moon pretty soon. I mean, it is a literal 100 years long, but um, mm-hmm. but hopefully. Yeah, according to Letterboxd, Poor Things is still not streaming, but I thought I saw somewhere that it was coming to streaming. So, Because I do want to watch that and The Favorite, but I don't know how much I like the director, but I'm, I'm in it for Emma Stone. So, because mm-hmm. I've seen yeah, nothing weird. by this director. Ooh, it's so, supposed to be released on the 27th, which is today. Holy shit. That's weird. Okay. Um, Poor Things will be released on digital Tuesday, February 27th, starting tomorrow. Hmm. Okay. Let's try to track that down. All right. Well, let's get into our uh, feature movies here. We start off with Old Boy. It's a 2003 South Korean action thriller film directed by and co-written by Park jan Wook. A loose adaptation of a Japanese manga of the same name, the film follows the story of Oh Desu, who is imprisoned in a cell that resembles a hotel room for 15 years without knowing the identity of his captor or his captor's motives. When he is finally released, uh, Oh Desu finds himself trapped in a web of conspiracy and violence as he seeks vengeance against the enigmatic Lee Woon Jin. So... You wanna you wanna dive into the fun facts first, or uh, yeah, yeah, I'll dive into the fun facts. But I need um, so that first fun fact that you have there about how four live octopuses were killed during that scene. What you um, yeah. So the gentleman who played Odasu Cho, Choi Min Sik um, mm-hmm. is at least at the time was Buddhist, mm-hmm. and killing live animals is against his religion. Mm-hmm. And he said, fuck it, and did it anyway for the method. And that is hard as fuck. I'm just also eating a live octopus is is pretty hard. I'm not even going to front 
because that just seems very slimy and wriggly and feels like um, I would I would throw the fuck up. So mm -hmm. and that's, apparently that's, it's it's common to do that and it's Korea, right? And but yeah. usually it's sliced like the uh, the sushi uh, chef. Uh, it's like, would you like it sliced? And no, he just chomps on down. But we'll get into that scene a little bit more later. Um, the line of paint, uh, the line of the painting on De Sassu's, uh cell reads, "Laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep and you weep alone." These are the lines of Eller Weller Wheeler Wilcox famous poem, "Solitude." You get a little tongue tied there. Alliteration. Um, the the telephone number o eight six six zero zero three three zero, which is supposed to go to Odasu's daughter's foster parents home in sweden has actually been shut down requested by the owner of the number go <laughs> figure um this is the second of director park chan wook's revenge trilogy which is uh sympathy of mr vengeance came out in 02 and the third is lady vengeance in 05 and i have the very nice uh trilogy box set from arrow that opens up like a like the elevator from this movie um okay yeah, so it's um it's very nice. These are all of those are very good movies. Old Boy is much better than both the other two, but the other two are also very good. And um you should you you as in you Justin and you the audience y'all should definitely if you have not seen those check those out as well. And if you haven't seen this movie, you one hundred percent should check this out. This is a fucking banger. And finally, uh, Otisu is in prison on the seven and a half floor of the building. This may be a tip of the hat to. Being John Malkovich was also takes place on a seventh and a half floor in its central. Uh, that was central in, central in its story. So you so. do you think that it's a nod or is it just a happy coincidence? Oh, uh, there's so much going on in this movie to where it's, it doesn't even really matter. Um, one of the fun facts was they almost named the sushi place Akira to go with Akira Kurosawa. So yeah, now you know. Now you know, and no one is half the battle. So uh, my first and only time seeing this was about a month into me using Letterboxd in July 2017. Uh, back then I was even more dependent on dubs than I am now. <laughs> and I actually, I don't know where I found it, but I found this dub of uh, Old Boy, and I connected it with a, uh, a Blu-ray rip I had, and that's how I watched it. But uh, all Korean this time, baby, which uh, okay. didn't go so well on, um, <laughs> what night was it? Uh, tonight is Tuesday. Tuesday, so, so sun Sunday night. Yeah, Sunday night. Like I, I had a I had a few drinks going into Oh Brother Where Art Thou and uh, enjoyed that movie thoroughly, but could not keep track of this or the damn. So let it go. Spent the whole last night with it, which was very good for me being able to really uh, take this movie in. So um, glad um, I did that. So how much do you remember about the dub version you watched versus the sub? the subversion um probably not at all okay so the reason that i asked this is i've only ever seen it in korean the, i don't know 10 times that i've seen it or whatever amount it is um is only been in korean um is how it was shown to me originally on netflix um back in the day but the first time i think carl saw it was or tr started to watch it was just the dub and like this isn't even like where he has an, a, an aversion to dubs like I do. It's that the dub is just genuinely terrible. Like, changes the whole movie apparently it's so bad. Um, hmm. So that's why I was curious um, if okay. you remembered much from like seven years ago versus now. Um, so I remember Battle Royale kind of had that feel to it because we started off watching it dubbed, but it had such like this goofy quality to it. We actually switched to. Um... The Korean that one too and it was that was actually made it a little better so um yeah it's interesting how yeah that can definitely impact um I think you even mean Japanese. like oh Japanese on that one and then like police story is like extra funny with like the really bad dubbing with Jackie Chan if you uh check that one out so just throwing it out there that I haven't seen but that is supposedly you know for Chinese movies like Chinese kung fu movies that is one of like the like the Charms exceptions yeah yeah one of the charms is the bad the bad dubbing i would much prefer to you know watch it outside of that in whatever um 
you know, its original languages, but that's, that's just me. Um, you know, call me. Yeah, it is Japanese for about. No, right mo- most people side with you. I'm, I'm, I'm the, the rare lazy cinephile well, exception. I, I mean, I won't say that it's lazy. Like we, we, I'm, I'm not going to like bust your balls about it here. Cause we, we've had this conversation Many ad times. nauseum, ad <laughs> nauseum. And you can go back and pick a random episode that has a foreign movie in it. And we're probably talking about dubs. Um, dubs versus subs but like you know like you've said you know some some people may not read as fast or you know like if you've got the movie on like you've got kids so sometimes it's a lot harder for you to 100 percent always be looking at the tv and 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 you know not have to pause it and that kind of stuff so like not being able to hear it and understand it is is a big difference like when you when you know like i don't have kids well i, I do but i don't have a kid that lives with me so it's not you know, I can just focus on the movie, focus on watching and, and reading the subs. And I read fast and I watch everything, even if it's in English. The weird thing about me is I understand my reading best when I hear my like internal voice reading it. And you don't have time to do that in a subtitled movie most of the time. Unless you're like reading it out loud. So like, yeah, like uh, like I've been wor- working on these novels and like I'm just kind of, you know, breezing through it and I'll catch this and that. And that's what ends up happening a lot of the time, especially with a really quick paced movie. And a lot of times you'll fill in a lot of gaps because I'll miss stuff because I'm just not consuming all that dialogue as if, um, you know, I, I w- had the time to just like slowly read it and hear my internal voice and and kind of take it in. Um, sometimes better than others. And it's kind of like typing where um Whenever you stop realizing you're typing, it, it all kind of flows. But whenever you, you know, are intentionally making sure you're reading, it's not going to stick quite as well. So that's kind of like what I go through. Okay. So tell me about your love for this movie. How 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 did you come across first seeing it? What made it so special? And uh, yeah, do tell. Okay, so it had to be back. Let me see if I can figure out what year it was. It must have been... Fuck, 2012, 2000, somewhere in that part, 2012, 2013. Um, I was hanging out at my buddy Ty's house. Um, and he was like, "Yo, we got you. Got to watch this movie. This movie's fucking great." He might. He, I don't even. I don't even think he told me that it was like fucked up or anything. He just was like, "Yo, this is a good movie. We got to watch it. Put it on." It was in you know in Korean or whatever. We watch it. And much like every person that I have shown this movie to since then, that scene at the end that we will get to, my reaction was like, oh shit, oh fuck, what the hell, yada yada, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was just one of those things like, like I'd seen Kill Bill and stuff, you know, and everyone knows my love of Kill Bill. So the revenge, the revenge plot reminded me of that, but like the shit with the hammer and the teeth, I had never seen that. Um, you know, that big twist, it was not something that, you know, we would really see in American cinema. Um, so it's just, it wasn't like anything I'd ever seen really. Um, and it's just, it's a very well-made movie. Like everyone I've showed it to was like, holy shit, this movie is fantastic. Like I put in my letterbox review that I showed my friend Brooke, um, this movie. So this was, um, like I got her to join letterbox. I think you follow her actually now too. Um, okay. And um, so she got Letterbox, and she's really big into like just big time action movies. That's more like more her speed. And so I recommended her a bunch of movies. Most of them were kind of like action stuff. And um, but I recommended her this, and she came over and watched it. So it was the first movie like we had watched like hanging out together. And she was quiet. Uh-oh. Like, <laughs> like she was quiet like almost the whole movie. She she made a little bit of noise when they they put the put the hammer on the teeth the first time, but then she was quiet the whole rest of the movie until that scene at the end, and just out loud was like no 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 like it was it was it was fucking great. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah no this that's I don't know if it's necessarily just one thing, but it's definitely my, my boy Ty Buckman. Um, shout out to hashtag Try Buckman for uh, hooking me up, showing me this movie for the first time. I, in return, showed him the unrated remake of I Spit on Your Grave to counter out, counteract his fucked up movie with a fucked up movie. Mm-hmm. Um, he was less appreciative of that movie than I was of old boy, <laughs> um, which is fair. 
that's a completely different kind of uh, fucked up movie. But mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's um, it's definitely like just a fantastic movie. It's neat to see such a like action flick like this have that artsy like angle to it. And it was reminding me a lot like Snatch and Fight Club to where it has this like punchy feel to it, um, artsy, but also really delivers some really, um, you know, good, interesting, um, you know, provocative uh, material. Um, it's neat to see uh, how thirsty is for vengeance, like right off the top there as he's, he's um, hanging the one guy off the building. Um, <clears throat> Uh, before he, you know, they cut to him being all pathetic and goofy in the drunk tank. Um, but if he thought that was bad, yeah, nothing is going to prepare him for what he's about to get into. So, like, I saw, like, we were talking about it off the top, and I don't, I guess that was Wiki, said that it was um, it was an, an action thriller, and like, he's, you know, an artsy action flick. Like, don't get me wrong, there's action in it. I mean, it has one of the greatest and most emulated fight scenes of all time. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't know if like, I would, I don't, this is not what I think of like as an action movie. Like you, you tell me to like pick my 10 favorite action movies. I'm not going to put this one in there. It's to me, this is more definitely a psychological thriller. It does have action scenes that hallway scene is chef's kiss. Um, and, and all of that. But yeah, I, I don't know if I would call it an action movie, but that's just me. That's not really super, super important, but right. Just same as fight club. You wouldn't really consider that, but it has like, moments of action so that's kind of what i'm getting at fight club has like a lot more action than this movie um well with all the different fight scenes and you've got like the plane blowing up and the building exploding and then the blowing up the buildings and like sneaking in to steal the the liposuction fat and trying to clip the dude's balls like it, it just it i don't know if it is an action movie but it definitely has i think it has more more action scenes than than um, old boy. All right. All right. So um, I'm glad I flicked back through it because I noticed that the pattern on the umbrella that um, he's standing under right before he gets kidnapped is the exact same as the gift wrap we see later on. Oh, shit. Okay. That is something I have never. It's this weird, I'm... like, diamond like pattern, purple kind of thing. Yeah, it's like yeah. a velvet purple pattern. I never noticed that the umbrella was the same as the gift wrap. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, the passage of time. Yeah. Huge theme here. Like even throughout like the end of the movie, they're constantly looking at like digital or not digital clocks and kind of digital clocks. It's like a, a manual digital clock. Um, and then like in the whole, um, opening uh, credit sequence is all like clocks and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty provocative to think of like what, what you would be like if like all of a sudden you, you, <laughs> suddenly lost 15 years of your life and it's not even like rip van winkle style where you're asleep the whole time it's like being tortured and training yourself and oh gosh so yeah and just and and you see like what it does to a psyche and then how it affects him throughout the rest of the movie and stuff it Mm -hmm. is it is definitely harrowing to say the least like and we cut from him being all like goofy and like giddy to go see his daughter in like the rain or whatever to all of a sudden like begging like what the hell is going on through a doggy door and he's already said it's been like a month at least so yeah it'd been a couple months at that point i think yeah pretty twisted story with yeah he's like gassed each night so like he doesn't even have to like suffer through like trying to sleep and then um they go and like he, he gets all like disheveled looking from being in there for like a month or whatever but then they go and clean him up and make him go through it all over again it's like oh my god such dynamic camera work and angles throughout the whole thing. Um, the shot of like seeing him like passed out on the ground and it was through like a vent in the ceiling. That was like what made me think of that there. But yeah, throughout the whole thing, it's really, really cool um, how the unique um, angles really kind of vibrant up the whole movie. Um, let's see. Only the window, but ba- oh, okay. His only window back to the world is the, his TV, which what he describes is like his companion and he, even his lover or whatever. And he sees the passage of time there, like with seeing like different like um, leaders come into power and New Year's and and so forth. And like they show like that's he sees all the world events. You know, he sees like Princess die, mm-hmm. her you know her passing away, the World Trade Center, 
um, which would have been pretty culturally relevant still. Like this movie wasn't too long after that. So in the 90s, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, this came out, you know, we were talking about 2001 for them being blown up and this came out in what, 2003. So Mm -hmm. 2004, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, yeah, so it's definitely used that. And like you said, it's his companion and his lover and he just, um, yeah, he, he's slowly going insane. We did skip over, um, how in one of the times when they knocked him out, Mm -hmm. they came and took one of his glasses that had his fingerprint and his DNA on it. And they took oh. his blood okay. and and then framed him for the murder of his wife and daughter. Oh, I didn't even know that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they take they take the glass that's got it like his lip print and I assume his saliva and shit in it, and then his blood. Mm-hmm. And then they um I guess they go and kill his wife and kill his daughter and um plant that evidence. So now Well his daughter gets adopted because she turns into an orphan, right? Um, well, yes, but they definitely, they frame it that she's dead. The audience at this point, having never seen the movie, would think that his daughter is dead. Yes. Um, but we having seen it know that she is not dead. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I guess the whole like ant and like getting swarmed by ants is basically just a visual of, you know, his, him going insane. Yeah, that's definitely, um, I mean, they also say that they put like shit in his drinks, so I mean, it could have been mm-hmm. something. To and do he does with get bugged drugs. like later on, so yeah, there's probably some monitoring element to it too. Yeah, it definitely is bugged later on, but um, yeah, there's definitely yeah some psychosis going on from being just in just trapped and by himself and no one to talk to and all of that. Yeah, the movie does a great job of like representing primal urges um, as a result of this confinement. Um, I appreciate that they showed, I think, the cover of the book, uh, Count of Monte Cristo, which is all about a, a long-term um, prison sentence and vengeance story, um, along with the... Uh, are you familiar with Oedipus Rex? I am familiar with Oedipus Rex. Um, and you horribly butchered the spelling of it, but that's fine. <laughs> it's a podcast, Joey. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> it took me a second. I was like, oh, I know what he means. Okay. Um yeah, no, I when I when I was flipping flipping through this, there was a part later on where you mentioned that and I had to like go back and do some research because I was like, I don't think this is at all like Oedipus Rex, and then it was like, okay, maybe maybe a smidge, but not quite. Different body part, but still pretty, yeah, pretty gnarly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh see it's neat to see how uh the desperation turns to um determination as he starts to strengthen himself and train against that wall. And it's cool later in the movie to see how flattened his knuckles are. And, you know, he and punches like the wall to the point of, and... mm-hmm, points, punches the wall to the point of breaking his arm and stuff. And so he's toughened up quite a bit. And then he even begins marking um, the years of his sentence with a, like a homemade tattoo gun that he made. Yeah. With essentially ink and needle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, like, I guess it's not stick and poke kind of tattoo, but it is, tattooing essentially mm-hmm. yeah I, I would never i have no idea how you would uh think to do that but yep yeah. um how devastating it is um you know being in there 15 years and then like the closest he gets to freedom is like barely being able to push out and see and like feel some rain on the outside i don't know how he was able to dig that one that far brick out but it's a good moment that definitely that gave me shawshank vibes okay um mm-hmm. i mean because you know took a spoon or I guess it wasn't a spoon. He took a rock hammer and dug out the wall for years and years and years. And he was using a chopstick, you know, when, you know, he got an extra chopstick and he was using it to dig out the wall. But I find it hard to believe that they didn't know he was doing that with everything being monitored on camera. Mm -hmm. And then like, Oh look, he's right on the verge of escaping and he gets put let out. So even though, you know, he was said to be in prison for 15 years. It just, I guess that was a coincidence, but still, that was like, okay. I don't think I fully bought into this movie the first time because I didn't, like, catch, like, the explanation of how the hypnotism was, um, kind of was used throughout. Like, I kind of just, like, I remember consuming it the first time being like, oh, hypnotism? Okay, whatever. But, like, 
it makes a lot more sense when you see how more woven it in it is to like the a lot of the stuff that happens um awesome moment of human connection when he embraces that suicidal guy and he's like dripping with tears and he just lusts to like feel a human face or whatever and he's like you must hear my story and then after like the guy hears it he's like all right fuck off <laughs> he's like has no interest in him <laughs> yeah he's like i'm gonna he's like i gotta do my shit and then you know he he goes down the elevator and like he's like spider monkey grabbing the wall yeah because he's, he's ne- he hasn't been girl. with yeah, because there's a woman in there, and it's been like 15 years. He's like a human female, and no, no ha- idea how to act or anything anymore. And then he he's walking out of the building, and the you see the dude hit the car, um, mm-hmm. jump, you know, fall, and he just keeps walking away from it. Does not give a fuck. Just signs find some random street thugs and tests out his fighting skills, and he admits they're on point. Um, yeah, he gets he, confronted. Oh, go uh-huh. I'll say because that's you know he goes I don't have any I, he's like I'm a fugitive I can't go back to my home so you know he I guess he, he like he's looking for somewhere to be and then he's like oh I guess it's time to put you know he grabs a dude's cigarette and then starts smoking it and they want to fuck with him and he's like I guess it's time to put this all to the test um and you know he learns uh dick shit as a new swear word because you know the TV doesn't teach you swear words um yeah, and then he, he fights him and beats him up oh, pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, shortly after, he's confronted by his homeless man who gives him a phone and money, which I guess essentially is like Lee Woon Jin, and we find out as like the, the captor who has this grudge against him. I guess he wants them to play a little game. Soft yeah, style. He, he's, yeah, the homeless guy's like, don't even think about asking me anything. I don't know anything. And then, you know, the phone rings. Oh, well, he ends up in this restaurant and then the phone rings and he's, mm-hmm. um, after he's bitten the octopus, the, eaten the whole, the live octopus, um, or I guess before, cause he, he talks on the phone and he, you know, he's talking to the, uh, the, the sushi chef. Who's like one of the most well-known female chefs in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all on usually, TV. That's how they knew each other. Yeah. She had, he had seen her on TV. Yeah. And, um, which her name is Mito. Um, and then he passes out eating the octopus mm-hmm. and she takes him back to her, her place to like heal him up and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, so after um, I watched this movie a little, or well, the first part a little drunk, I was like, oh, Joey, what's up with this octopus scene? And I think you did say something to the extent of it's him trying to finally get some control over something, which is yeah. so visceral, especially like how he's like cramming it in his mouth and the doggone octopus is like still like grabbing onto his face and stuff like no no you know like you know holding on for dear life but uh yeah such a such a crazy scene of him ripping through that oh yeah and also could you imagine now if they filmed this movie now and they were like we killed four octopuses four live octopuses for this scene yeah, how that fucking go so well <laughs> yeah no especially i think when there. they won i think they won some prize at can and they um i think the director uh thanked the uh, octopuses as well for their you know, the octopi s- i mean yeah the sacrifice uh, the sacrifice to the art yeah but yeah i think i definitely think it is supposed to be something like you know he's had all this this is the first time in 15 years he's had control also you know he feels like his life was taken away from him he wants to take the life of something else he can't he doesn't know who it is yet. He doesn't know who Li Wu Jin is. He he doesn't know anything other than mm-hmm. he's been let out. And the question is, you know, he's trying to find out who did it, why, all of that. So, yeah. I like how they mention all, like, the effects this, like, isolation had on him. Like, he has a vitamin imbalance. He's not, like, used to, like, common ailments or whatever. So he's kind of suffering through and, and once again he like he loses control of myself and almost assaults uh mito but um she wants yeah, which it, was, uh, fights him which, off which was even crazier because she she goes and gets a giant knife and she's uh, she's a chef she knows how to cut shit and she's like yeah the bathroom door is broken don't try anything or i will fucking cut you and he runs in there anyway and she fights him off and he kind of skulks away and then he's putting his clothes on and he's like this was bad of me i'm sorry um and yeah so yeah that's uh you know adjusting to being back in the outside world kind of thing so So i kind of lost track of what was going on during the next part but like she like starts talking and like 
we see like a giant ad on, ant on the subway train and i guess that's just kind of showing like how isolated and lonely she is so that's why they like start forming a bond am i reading that right yeah 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 so um after he attacks her and he's putting on her clothes she's like she's like i'm not mad at you for doing that i get it i brought you back home and then i denied you and she tells him that um you know she's going to she promises um when the time is right and she tells him yeah i'm gonna sing this song and all of that and then she asks him about the ants and talking about being lonely and then she i guess she's talking about a time where she was sitting somewhere and felt very lonely and saw the ants and was on the subway okay. so let's see uh tortures the dude that runs the prison by pulling out his teeth um oh oh i skipped a part okay so next he tries to um figure out where these dumplings he was eating for 15 years came from he uh he recalls seeing like a like a strip saying like blue dragon and so he's like yeah. l looking through all the blue dragons and it ends up being like the purple blue dragon which is the, especially the magic, weird it was the magic blue dragon oh okay and yeah. um he's all and pissed he off because that... like it's delivered like like in order to really deliver from that particular restaurant yeah he had to pass several other restaurants so but, made it um, all the more complicated. This also makes him not trust Mito because he's, excuse me, he goes looking through the phone book. He's looking through the phone book to try to find more restaurants. And it's the page for the Magic Blue Dragon is ripped out except for it leaves the word magic. Um, And so that's where he goes and finds it. And he chases the guy, Um, you know, follows him to the seventh floor. And then, you know, he, has the first guard and he has the hammer up and um you know gets to the head honcho guy and does does some um amateur dental work with the hammer um <laughs> to get information peeling. yep starts peeling teeth out but he don't know nothing but he becomes a pretty uh, pretty fun gangster after this yeah and that's where he gets like the tapes from where he got imprisoned and you know dude was like for 15 years and then he comes back and he's talking with Mito, and he gets another phone call, and he... Um, we forgot the fight. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the big <laughs> fight scene in there. I'm so, he's a lot I'm more so vulnerable funny. in that scene than I thought. Like, I, I, I envisioned him, like, being this total ass kicker, but, like, he's getting, like, stabbed in the back and beat up quite a bit, too. And when I first saw it, like, I didn't realize it was, like, the warden guy's, like, thugs. I thought it was, like, other guys that had just been, like, released all of a sudden and attacking him but yeah it's like his like gang right yeah it's the it's it's his gang or whatever yeah and it's so this is if you haven't seen this movie this is the shot that's like emulated or tries to be emulated it is a fight scene it is presented as in that it's one take with no cuts it's um, a wide I, shot yeah and it's it's shown like you're like if you could look through the wall and watch it mm -hmm. that is yeah how it's presented and you just see him you know, he's got a hammer. These guys have got sticks. Like you said, one guy stabs him in the back. Um, but yeah, he, he fucks them all up. You know, whether he doesn't necessarily kill all of them, but he definitely, you know, they're all, all pretty fucked up after being hit with a hammer a bunch and of the, times. the uh, elevator opens and there's a bunch more guys and it just cuts to him stepping out of the elevator and the guy's just falling out as, as a pile of bodies. <laughs> yeah, um... Very uh, reminiscent. Uh, well, I guess you know this movie came much later, but um, in Winter Soldier, where Cap fights all the guys in the elevator, um, mm -hmm. although you see that fight, but that is kind of the the vibe I was getting watching this again now. Um, and then he's walking through the street. He's covered in blood. He passes out, and this gentleman helps him and puts him in a taxi, mm -hmm. and uh, tells him, gives him the address of where to go. And then sticks his head in the window and is like, have a nice day or whatever, old Dasu. So you know, now you know who it is. You know That's it's Lee Wu Jin. Lee Wu Jin. You know. You don't know his name or anything. You know who he is. And then, so Mito, again, nurses him back to health. Well, um, he, he finds that she's being assaulted and she's like like hung up on the wall? Or is that's, that... Oh, that's a little bit oh, later. That's later, okay. Yeah, because that happened. He has to go to the internet cafe. He goes to the internet cafe to meet his high school friend, and they try doing some research. Um, that might have actually been before he went. I just remember that part where like he goes to um the room, 
and like the guy gives the word that you know he doesn't want the uh, the girl hurt or whatever, and they reluctantly you know walk out. But um, yeah, 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 the, the yeah. Scene yeah. I was so recalling. yeah, so that does happen. Um, um, he essentially he his buddy from the internet cafe is like, hey, I found out. Um, I don't remember. Was it um, figured out where the message came from or whatever? And it's an apartment building across the street from Mito's apartment. So he runs out of the room um, over across there. And it's uh, Lee Woo Jin and his like blonde haired, like number one guy. And this right. is where Lee Woo Jin is like, Hey, basically tells him I control everything kind of deal, you know, like, Hey, uh -huh. I've got a pacemaker. So if you attempt to torture me with the teeth trick to get your information, I'm just going to press this button that I had specially installed and kill me. Mm -hmm. um, if you kill me fast, you don't get to know why I did it, and you, know, you definitely should be asking why. Um, and then after they're talking for a while, he's like, hey, you know, you left the door open, and you left her over there all by herself. And so he runs over there, and she's strapped up against the mattress, which is leaned, leaned up against the wall, and, you know, mm -hmm. she's shirt's ripped open, and it's, yep. uh, it's homeboy with six gold teeth who, you know, he ripped his teeth out, and they're about to do the, the teeth trick to him, and he's got, like, he goes he starts like laughing time. at him too. <laughs> well, he goes to do it the first time and o Odasu winces and he's like, don't wince next time because you're imagining it. If you don't imagine it, you know, you can do anything or something like that. And he goes to do it again and Odasu starts laughing at him. And then the phone rings and they show up and give him a bunch of money to leave him alone. And, you know, he tells them, he tells me to, or he tells them that he's going to cut that dude's hand off and then he's going to cut this you know, for touching her breast. And one of the thugs is like, well, what about my tongue? And, um, <sighs> so then they, you know, they pack up and fucking start hauling ass, um, and end up in a hotel room. And they start boning. They oh, get yeah. down. They, they, get funky. they get down. Um, <laughs> pretty sure that Mito is a virgin. Uh, it's not. Oh sad. yeah. Cause she was saying, cause it hurt her hurt her so much so i think that's supposed mm -hmm. to be the implication there um that or you know dasu is you know hung like a mule um whichever one you want to go with i i think <laughs> it, i think it's virgin i think especially yeah. considering what we're going to get to in a bit the virgin is the correct answer there um and he then gases yeah, them after they're done in the act and leaves a little present to you know make himself feel that and he present. wants to make he wants to make sure that they're in love with each other for real um, and so they see the present and it's homeboy's hand who also had his teeth, you know, taken out. So it's his hand. They know it's his hand cause it's got his ring on it. So this is where they end up going to like a mall, like to a tech store and he walks up and you know, Hey, I've been bugged and they find the bug in his shoe and, um, he goes to like a salon. They, they well, they went Mm -hmm. They found out the high school and they went to high school and like looked in the yearbook and found um, Lee Woo Jin's picture. And then they found his sister, but all of her pictures had been erased because she had died. And mm -hmm. um, he went and started asking his like a person. He She was at a hair salon and he had left a note, like a clue that to go to the hair salon. So he goes to the hair salon um, and starts asking her questions and she's like, well, I asked so-and-so and they said that if, um, homeboy doesn't know, then you would know, um, homeboy being his friend from the, the, the internet cafe, uh -huh. which I think at this point, actually I skipped ahead. He, um, he had asked him. So o Odasu had asked his buddy about Lee Woo Jin's sister yeah, and he starts he start saying that she's this big old slut, slut and stuff, and, and Li Wu Jin is not like that and yeah, takes Lu, him out. <laughs> Li Wu Jin, since he doesn't have a bug anymore, is eavesdropping, physically eavesdropping in the internet cafe, and takes the the CD out of the disk drive, cracks it in half, and like stabs him in the throat with it, and tells him that it's you know. Then he picks up the headset and tells Odasu it's his fault, mm -hmm. and then so then we start getting. Flashbacks um, where flashbacks. Um, back to their high school days where um, Li Wu Jin um, got caught essentially fondling his sister in front of Odesu. And yeah. so Odesu like mentioned it and apparently ruined 
Liu Jin's life. Um, I, yeah, he, I thought he I kind of his, buddy, get, his mm-hmm. buddy who was the one who got killed in the the internet cafe was the one he told, and old Dasu was transferring out of the school, so he never had any recollection of the the aftermaths that happened oh, wow. okay. at that school because he was gone. So basically um what did you make of like this whole okay so so we see that he's fondling it and i am fondling his sister which i guess is just um basically hinting that you know he they uh there was some incest going on and then there's this whole thing about like like she a mat like they she imagined or she heard this lie about her being pregnant and so like she felt pregnant from it like what what would you take from that like do you think she was actually knocked up no, I don't. I don't think so. I think that it was. Um, it was like he said. She that she became so and en- en- enamored and encaptured with the rumor that she believed it, and since she believed it, her body started reacting to it. Um, and mm-hmm. there have been cases of things like that before, where someone believed something so much that their body reacted to it because of it. Um, and so and what happens at the end? She tries to kill herself. He stops her, and but she falls anyways. So, yes, he they're at the dam. He's got the picture of her standing there. Um, and I guess, you know, being a teenager and she's seeing how much strife it's putting him through, and I guess her as well, and he is trying to save her. And she's, you know, she takes that picture, but then she's, like, begging him to let her go because essentially like she's i guess you know for lack of a better term she's gonna fall on the sword kind of thing um to protect him to protect her brother and you know she's something about no regrets or whatever and so yeah she either he she eventually slips or he lets go or she wriggles out or what have you um and then you know falls into the um the river or the the lake um from the dam and uh dies so there's about 30 minutes left to this point, which is a lot of a lot of good time to to get to uh, Odesu confronting um, uh, Li Wu Jin in, in his penthouse. Uh, we get the whole explanation of how this hyp- hypnosis worked with him setting up uh, Odesu with uh, Mido on purpose, um, which then leads to I guess I'll, I'll let you uh, reveal the the big moment since it's it's your thing. All right, so th- this is. We are kind of already inside the point of no return because the first big twist has already been kind of been revealed. But this is literally, there is no point of, of no return. This is this is it. If you have not seen this movie and don't want everything 100% spoiled, this is the spot to stop. Okay. So, um, goes to Odo, goes to Li Wu Jin's penthouse. He fights some of his thugs. Um, and then he shows him that he's got this present. And it's the big purple present. And he opens the... Oh, it is important to, before we do that, get into this, that he takes Mito to the the thug, the, the guy who captured him. He takes him, takes her to his new building. It's all renovated and shit to hide her from Li Wu Jin with Homeboy and says that if I'm not back by July 5th, release her. Because Li Wu Jin told him he had so many days to figure it out. Okay, right. so he goes, opens the box, and it's a photo album. First picture is like old Asu. You can tell it's like from the 80s, and it's old Asu and his wife and a baby. And then it's the wife and the baby. And then it's like just the kid. And then she's getting older and older, and you realize that it's Mito. Mm-hmm. And he now knows that Mido is his daughter and that he has fallen in love with and has boned his daughter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and which hit, which it hit me a lot harder this time than it did the first time. The first time I was like, Oh, hypnosis and eh, whatever, this is kind of weird. But the second time I was a lot more into the characters and into the, like what happened to them. And it was a lot more believable. And so it had a definitely a much more bigger impact on me this time. So, um, um I mean, I have all boys, so uh, as a father of a little girl, um, any particular weight as well? I mean, like, obviously, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I know what my daughter looks like or everything, but, you know, it, it's 
it is one of those things like, oh, that's that's rough. That's terrible. Like, I couldn't imagine finding out something like that. That it's you know, it's it's gross, um, mm-hmm. especially the fact that, you know, someone set them up to do this. Like, obviously, they didn't know they didn't. This isn't, um, you know, like where they decided, you know, we, well, we're we like each other, even though we're, you know, mother or daughter, son. Wow. Daughter, father. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you banged one out. I mean, they didn't know, but yeah, it's still, it's still very unnerving. Um, just so much general. great style throughout that whole like reveal with all the, the weird angles and camera stuff. And Oh yeah. And visual like, I style don't even, just on point. sometimes you don't even notice it because of how like invested in the story. Cause you know, at this point, um, Lee Woo Jin starts talking about how he's basically raised her since she was three years old. He, you know, he's looked oh, out for her, that. given her money, um yeah so he's basically not only did he like take her from him he also was like her secret benefactor and then put him put her back in his life for this explicit purpose purpose for his revenge um but this is a scene you know Odasu starts trying to fight him his blonde bodyguard is just judo throwing him everywhere but mm-hmm. eventually um, Lee Woo Jin shoots that guy in the head at like yeah. point blank range. Don't give a fuck um, about his men. Does not give a fuck. You are correct. I mean, he um, and then old, old, old Asu starts begging him like, "I'll do anything. Like I'll be your dog." He's like barking around, shaking his tail, and at Ola, this point, licking his feet. <laughs> yeah, he's on the phone with Mito, and Mito's like, "There's a box here. It's like the one we got in our hotel room. I'm scared." And he's like, "Don't open it. Don't open it, no matter what." And you know, he even at one point threatens Li Wu Jin, "Hey, I'll kill you if you don't if you do this." And then he's like, "No, no, I'm sorry." And then he goes and he picks up this pair of scissors, and he grabs uh like a handkerchief, purple handkerchief. And, yeah, holds his tongue out, and cuts it off like. You don't see it. You you see the scissors and you see, you know hear the sound, but you don't actually see it. But it's still very visceral. Oh yeah, and, and, he, uh, and he, he plunges his head in the water, and all the blood comes blood out. And out. this is definitely the the Oedipus Rex. It's not plunging his eyeballs out because he slept with his mom. No, he's cutting his tongue off because he slept with his daughter. Yeah, and because like yeah, because his tongue is what got him there. Um, specifically, Lee Wu Jin said it was Odasu's tongue not Lee Woo Jin's dick that killed his sister. Um, so he cuts his tongue out and he, he's, and that's stuck. what all that is. That's ultimate. You think that's ultimately why Lee Woo Jin, uh, showed him a little mercy is cause he, he, he cut off the tongue. I, I think, um, I don't think that, I think the mercy was to Mito because he did like raise her, like he said, or, you know, because he gotten his revenge on like, He's tortured the man. Now the man's cut his tongue out. This man knows what he's done. Mm-hmm. How much does that fuck up Mido? And maybe he does care for her in some way. But yeah, there is some compassion there in some way. You know, like clearly he laughs at him as he's groveling at his feet. Yeah, he he understands. Like this guy has done probably way more. Maybe maybe he wasn't expecting that reaction. Maybe for whatever reason. But yeah, he. He chooses, he, he picks up the phone and tells them to leave the box unopened to not show her the box. And then, you know, he's like, well, I have my revenge on you. What else is left for me? And mm-hmm. you see that this is where you see the final flashback of him on the, the bridge with his sister and all of and her sister falling to her death. And then you see him holding his hand out in the, the flashback and then you see it to curling around the gun and then you see him shoot his head or it comes, it snaps back to reality with like his brains blowing against the wall. Mm-hmm. And then it shows his body in the bottom of the elevator. Well, before a little bit before that, I didn't know they sued, try to like set off the, uh, the trigger and it didn't even work. Yeah. And it was yeah, like so a the, green laser or something and old he, cameras. Oh, yeah. 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 So it was, um, the, the thing that he said was the, the, the trigger to his, to stop his, um, peacemaker, his pacemaker, actually was just like a laser pointer and it also it turned on the stereo which had the recording of them having sex in the yeah that was pretty brutal yeah um with the oh it hurts and all of that stuff so yeah that was just that extra like 
kind of like fuck you thrown in there. Um, and then you see Odesu, um, he has written a letter, um, you know, at this point he, he's, he's talking and narrating, but you know, he's, it's basically this person reading his letter, which was the same hypnotist who had hypnotized him and hypnotized Mido, which he knew who it was because, um, Lee Wu Jin, of course, like all movie villains explained it to him, <laughs> um, about how they, you know, were able to make them fall in love. And then she was like, well, you know, they're going to, tr- basically they tried to do some, um, sun, um, sun, sunshine of the, the Jim Carrey movie. This name is sunshine. Oh, Eternal of sunshine the of the spotless yeah. mind. Yeah, there we go. Eternal Wipe his sunshine. memory. Okay. Yeah. yeah so yeah. he, he goes to get some hypnosis too, in order to forget this, uh, the, the bad he slept with his daughter and, um, I, I that guess involves forget that. Yeah. Forgetting that she is his daughter. I think it was the, the. The okay. idea so they could still be in love and still be together. Because the, sep- the hypnotist's strategy was to separate him into two, the monster knowing the truth, and then um, him, and then like getting rid of yeah, the monster. The, yeah, the monster knowing that she's his daughter. So I think, yeah, it was so that they could still be together, and he just wouldn't know. He wouldn't have to know this terrible thing, and he could still be with her. And then he, she finds him after, you know, he wakes up in the middle of the snow. She finds him, and she's dressed they in red, hug. Very uh, yeah. striking. Um, and she hugs him and he's smiling at first and then it ends in a grimace and it's, you know, you can infer that of he immediately remembers like this hypnosis didn't work or, Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, um, you know, I guess I I don't really see any other way to really take that. I guess there could be, but yeah, that was kind of one of the things I I was was to postulate to you that, that same question, but yep. It's uh, it was great to give this one another shot. Um, the nuance really synced in this time. It's a thrilling, grueling story about so much human suffering was done with so much style. I mean, it would be a crime for me. I'd probably get locked up for fifteen years if I didn't give it a five. So there you go. Um, yeah, I think so. I don't, I don't um, know how much <laughs> you read of like, because you follow so many people. So I don't know, you know, how many reviews of other people you read. But um, Carl, even in his review said that he thinks this is the greatest movie of the 21st century and it's not even close. Um, I, I think it's also a five. I mean, it is when, when my, like I said in the last podcast, when my top five on Letterboxd isn't being themed or anything, if it's just my true top four, um, it's number two. So, and it's Carl's number two, oddly enough behind, um, the shinning. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Feature movie two, moving right along. Oh, Brother, Where Out Thou is from 2000. It's a satirical comedy drama written by and produced by the Coen Brothers. It stars George Clooney, John Turturro, Tim Blake Nelson, John Goodman, and Holly Hunter. The film is set in Mississippi, um, rural Mississippi, in 1937. It follows three escaped convicts searching for hidden treasure while a sheriff relentlessly pursues them. Eh, does he? I guess. Um, its story is a uh, modern satire, which is incorporating social features of the American South and is loosely based on Homer's epic Greek poem, The Odyssey, so they say. All right. So um, kind of a funny story here. So me and my buddy John, I remember watching this with him. I think it was like in our college years. And yeah, we, we had a ball watching this movie. And I actually uh, bought him the soundtrack. And he was actually a little disappointed because, I mean, it has the Man of Constant Sorrow on there, but it has, like, a lot of, like, not remixes, but, like, you know, like, ha- songs that are like that, but not really. Um, but apparently this thing sold, like, hotcakes and got some Grammys and shit, so pretty neat. Yeah, and it was more famous than the movie, and I think... So you you read my review where I said I had completely misremembered this movie and you were very intrigued about it. So there is uh-huh. a scene in this movie, and I remember it pretty... It's like the only thing that I remembered about this movie. And then I watched the movie, and it's not in the fucking movie. Like, oh, what's that? Even, even remotely close. Okay, so like I remember the Soggy Bottom Boys being in jail, like in their prison suits or whatever, and they were like the prison band and they were traveling around to different prisons as the soggy bottom boys before they broke out. Mm. 
Yeah, that and like, I remember a scene where they were like trying to escape, but it wasn't in the movie at all. And huh. I had said that to Carl after the movie, and he's like, well, shit, now that you say that, I kind of remember that too. We went on the fucking internet, we went on YouTube trying to find like the music video. I was like, well, it must have been in the fucking music video for, for the song, right? Like, that's the only other thing it could be. But there was no music video. Everything that we found was just um, Man of Constant Sorrow from the movie. So I don't know where in the fuck I remember that from, how I came about it. I'm going to be real. I don't even know if I saw this movie because I. the only other thing I remembered was the part where he pulls the beard down and winks. And that's like everywhere. Like that was in like probably the trailer. So I don't know, honestly, if I had actually even seen this movie, but just thought that I had, because I remembered jack shit, less than jack shit about this movie. Okay. So that is how I misremembered it. A couple more fun facts. Uh, 350 extras were hired for the, the KKK rally sequence. We'll get, we'll get to that. Um, although Homer is given a co-writing credit on the film, uh, the Coen brothers claim they have never read the Odyssey and are familiar with it only through cultural admosis and film adaptations. I don't know about that, but um, we'll get into it more. Uh, George Clooney practiced singing for weeks um, in order to be the uh, you know the voice in this, but it ended up being dubbed by uh, bluegrass singer Dan Timinski. Um, Bro, if you're George Clooney, how pissed at you? Are pissed are you that you practice for weeks? And I get it that this guy is an actual bluegrass singer and probably did sound better than George Clooney. But like, bro, could you imagine? Especially then when it starts winning all these fucking Grammys and shit and the album starts selling, like, I'd mm -hmm. be pissed. I'm just saying. The Man of Constant Sorrow was first published in 1913 by the blind Richard Burnett. Um, last one here. Ulysses Everett McGill's childhood home, shown at the end of the film, where they go to search for the ring, is actually based on the cabin from Evil Dead 1. Uh, Joel, Joel, Joel Cohen was the assistant editor on that film, his first feature. So, it all, okay. all ties together. All right, so this is like low key one of like the movies my uncle recommends. He he likes a lot of Coen Brothers stuff. He uh, he actually showed my parents Lebowski, and I remember him talking up Fargo big time when I was a kid. But I do remember him saying there's this quirky movie they did that had like this like Odyssey kind of like tie in. Didn't see it for years later, but uh, it clicked right back in my mind whenever I started watching it. Um, and it's really I think the music by far is just like the lifeblood of this movie. It really fuels like the fun aspects of it i mean the main characters end up big singers and there's just so much good music throughout this to really uh create that feel of the old south oh yeah like the music is 100 percent what makes this movie i mean like all the actors were great the movie like, the directing i mean it is a cohen's movie all that shit's good like that's just you know that that is what it is but like yeah the 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 the, the singing is what makes this movie. There are some funny scenes that we'll, I'm sure we'll get to in a bit. As, lots as well. of it. Oh no, it's a straight uh, up comedy. <laughs> There's lots of funny. I mean, yeah, George, <laughs> George Clooney is just so good in this movie. Like, and yeah, like, just like his obsession with keeping his hair like perfect and having mm -hmm. the right hairdo um, or the Dapper right Dan. shit for his, yeah, Dapper Dan and having his, uh, his hairnet and all of that. Like, Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. Whenever he was in the barn, um, yeah, a bit of a surprise. You know, we open up on the chain gang. You know, you're kind of, kind of experiencing more something a little bit more serious. And then all of a sudden they come up from the um, the tall grass there and are trying to escape. And um, they make it to the railroad tracks and uh, they run down this train, jump up. And he's like, oh, hey, y'all. And um, But his buddies, they don't make it on there. But since they're all chained together, they come slinging out of the train. So nice big laugh to get things going. Um great balance of characters like you have tim who's kind of like this dim-witted character and Totoro, he is a little bit more grizzled and uh they're all lured to this uh so clooney says he he knocked off an armored car and um has a treasure for them to help him find and so that's what they they set off to do yeah they have to do it um the reason that he had to break out then was because where they're building this dam is mm -hmm. going to flood the valley where he hid this money so they they not only 
do they have to are they breaking out they like they have to get this money by a specific time which is a pretty common trope in trope in like getting like breakout movies where people are like escaping prison and shit like you know got to break out to find it before the building's destroyed or it's you know a building's built on top of it or a flood because of a dam you know whatever mm. yeah i love the um the whole like g golly comedy of like this this um and that's mixed with like all these like blind guys that are kind of saying like these prophetic things. I mean, it starts off with like they hitch a ride with this one blind guy who's on this rail cart and he's just spouting some kind of a uh, prophetic whatever. I hadn't really looked into it, but um, yeah, a lot of that throughout here. I mean, it, it does. It does. I mean, what the guy says does come true. You won't find the treasure that you seek, and you'll find mm -hmm. a cow on top of a. Oh, is a that what it says? Okay, <laughs> that comes yeah. around in the end. <laughs> Glad yeah. you pointed that out. Um, the Odyssey reminds me a lot of like the true story thing in Fargo, where it's like, oh, this is based on a true story. I mean, there's elements here. You got the one-eyed guy. I guess he could be the Cyclops. Definitely a siren scene. Um, and then Clooney winning his wife back in the end. That's all kind of taken from the Odyssey. But very, very loose. I think they almost probably put that in there for you to look closer at that kind of stuff than what actually what they actually put in there. But um, yeah, good old Coen brothers fucking with you. They would never. They they would never. Um, I had to pause it and rewind it during the whole run. Uh, the run on the R U N O F T thing. I was like, Oh what? yeah. <laughs> R U N O F. -T. She run off. <laughs> oh yeah, and then you know the they, his cousin, uh, not John Clooney, not George Clooney, but one of the other characters, cousin. The Toros. Turns him, yeah. yeah, he turns him in for the. For the 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 bounty money, and then the boy breaks breaks them out. Um, you know, because they start they 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 have a habit of like setting barns on fire. <laughs> yeah, the police set the barn on fire to try to smoke them out, and they threw a cocktail up there, a Molotov cocktail, and one of them throws mm -hmm. it back, and it catches the gas on fire, and it runs into the car that's full of the ammo and the Tommy guns, and yep, lots of Tommy guns, all the Tommy guns, and so the, the all of a sudden you see like you know the Model T or whatever bust through the bottom of the barn and it's the boy trying to tell him tells him to get in they're like what are you doing and he's like i'm gonna r u n o f t and he has like a brick strapped to his foot so they can reach the pedal but then yeah like a they, leave, they they ditch him after they get a little bit ways down the road um Clooney tries to get him hand, some hands on dapper dam but they don't have his right hair jelly <laughs> it's like two uh two weeks in any direction it would take it to get it uh shipped in while tom tim's like oh you want some gopher yeah, they can. That's just, you want? He asking everybody, you want some gopher? Yeah, that kind of leads into this whole like down by the river scene where we really get this like southern uh, religious kind of deal going on with all the, this congregation going on down the river, and they're singing that and getting baptized. And Tim feels like he has some salvation in life now since he was a prisoner. Yeah, they they done wa him wash of their sins, and then they try Class. to pick up. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So they they they, they stop. Stop in their car to pick up this old colored boy who was uh, the guitar player who sold it, said he had sold his soul to the devil. At the crossroads. Be able to play this here, be able to play this here guitar. There's a movie about that. Um, God, what's it called? Is it called The Crossroads? It actually stars the kid, uh, it still stars Ralph Macchio. Oh, okay. The kid, the kid from The Karate Kid. <laughs> talk while i figure this out i really i'm um, highly curious so at this point they um they say the they're talking to to the guitar player and he says you know he's heard he's going to this town he's heard this dude will pay you for money for singing to a can yep so they roads. find a place and they they roll into there and it is our old boy milton from um oh office, office space, space. Mm -hmm. yep he's blind and you know he asks them if they're black and they go well of course we are and he's like oh no we 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 don't play black music here, only old timey music. And he's like, "Oh, we've been taught in the ways of old timey." And then <laughs> they record the, the constant sorrow, and they scam him out a little bit of money. Say that there's like six of them instead of four of them. I'm in the man of constant sorrow. Sorry. And he's just jamming out to the whole the whole time to it, and then singing in the they, can. They they go to leave and run into Dapper Dan coming in to make, I guess, a speech on the radio. Yeah, I guess he's like the current governor. He, yeah, um, he is he's getting ready for a little bit of a race. Governor of Mississippi. Um, um, 
they're making their way across the countryside. The, uh, the I guess he's the sheriff or some kind of scary lawman with uh, sunglasses is out burning barns looking for him. He's not in the movie nearly as much as what you think, I and mean, he he gets like zero character development. He's just like yeah, he's just, just a like, cop trying to catch them. That is that is all essentially death. Doing. Yeah, yeah. Their and their car gives out, and now they're walking down the street. Um, well, this is this is before they find Tommy because the Tommy's not with him at this point because it's just. Anyway, there's a scene where um, they're walking down the street and this, this car is just coming down the highway and all this money's flying out of it and they get in and it turns out it's uh, the gangster baby face Nelson and um, he gets George Clooney to take the wheel while he opens the suicide door and starts shooting at the cops mm-hmm. with his Tommy gun and then he's all he they pass a cow field and he's like, man, the only thing I hate worse is cops than cows and just puts like five or six bullets in this one cow. Not the lifestyle. Pops- <laughs> and then it causes causes the cows to run across the street, and one of the cops just fucking plows the cow, mm-hmm. flips over, and they like go and rob a bank that you know the other boys weren't really expecting to. And he's like, "I'm gonna leave you with my share to loot," and you know he's yep. down on himself, I guess, come down from the high of you know robbing and gunfighting cops and stuff. So. Yeah, all kinds of southern hijinks ensue as they're making their way across the country. Uh, they steal a pie from a windowsill, but leave some cash to pay for it. Um, so many nice... And the, and the colors are very muted, I would say. They're like not real bright green, but like kind of more limey greens. As, um, yeah, we see these you know, beautiful um, you know, trees hanging over the roads. You know, very southern in its uh, aesthetic. I don't think they're all over the country. I think they're just still in Mississippi. They're just trying to get across Mississippi. No, no, the country, the countryside of Mississippi. Is okay, kind of gotcha, I gotcha, gotcha. Uh, not sure what happened with the sirens, but uh, Tim thinks uh, Totoro got turned into a frog. <laughs> yeah, they're really oh, yeah, boozing that... them up good. I don't know what happened there. Um. Yeah. Well, they 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 got him. I guess separated, and they turned him in for the 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 money, the bounty money, because mm-hmm. they find him later. Um. In the chain gang again. In the chain gang again, yeah. They find him later and they bust him out. So, um, yeah, he um, he's about he's getting whipped and he isn't talking. And they go to hang him and he starts talking. So they, they put mm-hmm. him back Don't, on the chain gang. He tells them about the treasure. So they know yeah. to uh, kind of uh, camp out there and uh, catch him at that point. Uh, they run, um, Meanwhile, George and Tim run into uh, John Goodman, who is acting like this holy roller kind of fella. Uh, he has an eye patch, so I guess we can assume that he is our titular, or not titular, uh, but he's the Cyclops of the, the story. And, um, yeah, he's a real piece of shit luring them um, out into the middle of nowhere with um, you know promises of, like, selling Bibles or whatever. Then he ends up mugging them. Yeah, after they, he gets them to pay for their food, pay for his food, he, uh, he, he, he doesn't just mug them. He, like, breaks a branch off. And, and George Clooney the whole time is just like talking to him, like waiting for him to reveal the secret. And he bashes the other dude in the face. And then George Clooney's like, I don't see this. And he bashes George Clooney in the face. And then the other guy tries to stop him. And then he takes the frog and uh, squeezes it and just crushes it. John Godman doing John Godman things. Um, so, yeah. Um, but then, All yeah, right. they find Totoro, and then they break him back out. Mm-hmm. Um, well, a little they... while later. But, um, yeah, at first they don't believe it because they, they're like, yeah, it's kind of spooky how they keep passing these chain gains. And um, he's like, they're like blinking their eyes, seeing if it's actually him. Um, we get this neat scene where it's like this big southern politics scene, like the All the King's Men. Not sure if you read that, but, um, yeah, cl- um, they make it to town. Uh, Clooney... Um, finds his girls they're singing at a political rally and he's like hey girls what's going on and it's like you don't exist you got hit by a train mommy mommy says you're dead <laughs> mommy says you're dead and she's gonna marry this new guy and he's bona fide <laughs> he's bona fide oh, right right bona fide <laughs> need to see uh because the holly hunter's uh he's a she's a cohen's regular ever since like um raising arizona uh she's very stern looking in this movie she kind of scares me but um i guess that works for her coming around to uh, George in the end after he rocks the party. Um, 
yeah, wild chance meeting at the uh, the movies. They uh, they're they're yep, doing yep. a picture show and and they march the 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 chain gain in. Do not seek the treasure. What? <laughs> Do not seek the treasure. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, Clooney lets them know the treasure was all a lie. And then um, they start getting into it, but then all of a sudden they stumble upon one of the damnedest things you've ever seen in a movie. This freaking very elaborate KKK ritual, which reminded me of like the Temple of Doom ceremony or maybe um, what happens in the middle of Eyes Wide Shut, which I don't think you know about. Um, I haven't seen Eyes Wide Shut since I was like 15 or 16. So yeah, I just don't, oh, okay. I don't remember it. Okay. But yeah, it's quite the spectacle of like these... Um, yeah, this, this, there's all this pageantry and like these, because you would not expect to, you, you'd you expect to see more like what we see in um, Django, where it's a bunch of idiots on horseback and they're like, hey, you know, like, what do we Can't do now? Kind of thing. And, yeah. But Can't this is much more ag- organized. You got them like doing all this crazy choreography, very, very spooky shit. Um, and yeah, they beat up the color guard and take their uniforms and. Mm-hmm. They they come to save the they come to save Tommy and then mm-hmm. they um it turns out that the the other president the other go- governor other candidate for governor yep. is the leader the of the gra- KKK with yeah, his the Grand midget. Wizard or whatever yeah he's, he's the, the one Grand singing Wizard. right yeah he's as he says later on he's a part of a secret society um and you come to find out that uh that um old boy trying to marry George Clooney's wife is uh also in the kkk but you know they they think that they're black because they're all covered in dirt and soot and oh okay i didn't even pick up on that yeah they call them say that they're they're black or colored or something uh mr cyclops john goodman's there and he's pretty badass as he catches this like projectile stick that's coming at him but then it's the confederate flag okay yeah, it's, it, it's the Confederate flag that they took and then just chucked it, and he caught it like an inch from his good eye. Yeah, and then he gets smashed by a burning cross. But yeah. Okay, soggy bottom boys. They go and kind of crash this political rally. They uh, they have these beards. Like I guess that was a disguise, but um... yeah, it's supposed to be a disguise. You know, they're looking like miners or something, I guess, and they're up there performing while um he's George Clooney's trying to convince Homegirl to come back to him, and then. They go into constant sorrow, and he, the the crowd goes fucking ape shit, mm-hmm. and um, so they start leaning into it, and then that's when the Grand the Wizard's go- like, "Hey, hey, they just broke up our rally or whatever," and um, crowd turns on him big time and and push him out, and it's good news for the incumbent governor. He's uh, yeah, his uh, bigot uh, opposition is probably no match at this point, and uh, some good dance moves to the. I love the. The very old timey dance moves were very effective in this movie. <laughs> oh yeah, and then you know he 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 pardons them and you know says, "Hey, you guys are going to be part of my cabinet and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff." So, and then they're walking, thinking they're good to go, but then they run into the old baddie, and they're yeah, about they went, to. Oh, go yeah, they, they they go back to the original cabin to get the original wedding ring. Because she won't get married without the wedding ring. Oh, okay, okay. And that's why yeah. they're there. Yep. You got three black guys uh, digging graves. They're talking pathetic. I'm not sure if they were blind or not, but um, yep. And then we got a great flood after the uh, the our boys start praying to the Lord, uh, please give them salvation, and um, delivers. And so, and just like the prophet said, cow on the roof, and I think they're uh, hanging off of a. A casket from the um the whole valley getting flooded so yep, yeah they're hanging on a... to, the ca- to the casket and tommy's holding on to the roll top desk where the ring was which wasn't even the correct ring <laughs> okay um yeah very biblical feeling in but then you got george like oh you know soon they're gonna be a power grid and you know very he's almost kind of pathetic in himself of saying like where the country was going with electricity so um that's oh brother where art thou um Another pure piece of Cohen magic wrapped with this south, um, this veil of mythology uh, with these chain gang fellows trying to make it on home. Uh, a bit more funny and quirky than most of their serious work. I I kind of prefer a little bit harder nose on my Cohen films, but this is quite the delight. I 
probably falls between a four and four and a half for me. Um, I've got it. Uh, I think I put it at five, which is what I had misremembered it as, and I was just like, no, this is still this is still a, a great great movie. So, yeah, all right, definitely. my favorite. And my favorite part of the show, where we're heading next. Now, since I have a big announcement, you want to go first? I have a big announcement. So I had said last time that I had kind of, I, I, I think I either said it on the show or we might have said it off off podcast, but I, I said that I had like kind of planned out all the movies that I was going to pick for this for this year. Well, I, I, I've now went against that. Like I made a list, had it picked out, <laughs> and uh, I completely went off script. Um mm-hmm. And I decided to just go something completely off the wall. Um, okay. Yeah. So we're we're gonna go find out about the the air speed of velocity. Ooh. Of a of a of unladen a Afri- air. Yeah. African swallow. Yeah, that's the one. The Holy <laughs> Grail, baby. The Holy I Grail. Listen, I just listened to a podcast on, from Cinefix on that. That's great. So. Um... Can't go wrong with uh, old Monty Python. I was wondering if you're a fan of them boys. Yep. All right. So starting a new series, and this series is Love or Hate. So one episode, I'll do something I love, a movie I want to love that I want to revisit, and then the next episode will be something I hate, but I want to experience with you. So we'll start with love. And I loved Run Lola Run when I first saw it. Fuck yes. Fuck yes. This movie... I have been meaning to watch for years and it's always like couldn't find it or couldn't get a good, you know, a good copy, whatever. So fuck yes. That is, that was literally just, I just said yesterday that I needed to watch this movie. (laughs) I think I've been talking, I've been thinking about it for a while for a pick, but yeah, this, uh, this is the right time. All right. And if you'd like to follow the podcast, make sure to email us at the Average Joe's Movie Clubcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And Justin, why do we do this show? I am the man of constant sorrow. And we love talking about movies. There will be no encore. Thank you and good night. <laughs>